On a still and remote step in the far reaches of modern-day Mongolia, a young bride named Holin makes the journey to her new home with her new husband, imagining what her new life will look like, but she never could have imagined how her future would play out. Her new husband tells her of her new home and the family that she will now be a part of. He is Chilidu from the powerful Merkid tribe who occupy the fertile grassland to the west of her own tribe, the Olkanud. The two seemed a perfect match for each other, certain to have a bright future for themselves and their future children. But as they dream of their future together, fate would have it otherwise. Blinded by the future, they forget to notice the present, as in the distance, a man sits atop a cliff, plotting his strategy for what will be a turning point in world history. He is Yesugui, from a small band of herders too poor and weak to obtain a wife as beautiful as Holin. This small band is what would come to be known as the Mongols. The kidnappers rush down the hill to claim their prey. Chilidu attempts to distract them, but to no avail. He is forced to flee in order to spare his own life. And just like that, Holin has a new husband. Her new husband already had a wife and son, which will greatly diminish her position in the new family that she will be brought into. But soon enough, she brought Yesugui a child, who was born clutching a black blood clot the size of a knuckle bone in his hand. He had taken a clot of blood from inside his mother and brought it with him into the world. Holin had no idea what to make of the blood clot. What sign could this possibly represent? Was it a prophecy of the future power of the boy, or of the evil of him? To this day, no one can say for sure. Shortly after his birth, the boy's father arrived home. He had been off on a campaign against the Tartars, where he had killed a man named Temujin Uji. When asked what to name the boy, he chose the name Temujin. Temujin was not valued highly by his father. When Temujin was of age, he and his father set out to find him a wife. They headed towards his mother Holin's tribe to the east to find him a suitable wife. Under Mongol custom, marriage is handled in such a way where the to-be husband must provide labor of some kind to the wife's tribe for several years, in addition to a gift, in order for the marriage to take place and the wife to be given to the other family. Along the way, the two had traveled alongside another family, whose daughter, Bort, was of suitable age for the boy. The two children took well to each other, and their fathers decided to allow the marriage. Temujin would spend his foreseeable future working for the family and falling in love with his new wife. After leaving his son with the new family, Yesugui came across a feast being held by the Tartars. He slipped into the party and attempted to hide his identity as the man who had killed one of their own in a battle years before. His attempt failed and he was poisoned. He managed to return home to send word to his son to come back to his father. When Temujin had returned home, his father had already died. The larger clan that the family had lived with, the Tayochid, no longer had any reason to keep the family of two widows and four children. Shortly after Yesugui's death, the Tayochid left, leaving behind the six to fend for themselves. This began the lowest point in Temujin's life, living off nothing but small berries and roots dug up by his mother. Temujin fashioned arrows from small bones and branches, curved sewing needles to create fish hooks, and eventually learned to hunt larger prey with his brothers. Gradually over time, Temujin made friends with another boy named Jamoka, who camped nearby Temujin's family. They were distantly related through his father, but the two decided to form a pact and become brothers. They swore an oath of eternal brotherhood by exchanging gifts and consuming each other's blood. The two would grow closer together and become pivotal characters in each other's lives. The two briefly parted ways when Jamaka's family traveled elsewhere for winter. During this time, Temujin's anger towards his half-brother Begter grew. Because he was slightly older than the other brothers, he assumed the role of the leader of the family. He was capable of ordering each of the family members to do any action that he chose. One day, Begter took a bird that Temujin had shot for no other reason than to assert his dominance. Angered by this, he returned to his mother, but she asserted that Begter was the first son of Yesugui, and therefore could do as he pleased. Temujin decided then and there that that was not the life that he was going to live. Together with his full brother Kassar, he approached Begter, who was sitting on a nearby hilltop overlooking the steppe. The two circled their brother in the tall grass and surrounded him as they would any prey. Kassar came from the front and Temujin from behind. Once close enough, they knocked their bows and stood out of the grass. Begter sat still and refused to show fear in the face of his younger brothers. He simply reminded them that the real enemy was the Tayajid who had left them to die. I am not the lash in your eye, the impediment in your mouth. Without me, you have no companion but your shadow. He sat cross-legged as his twelve-year-old brothers continued to approach him. He made one final request, 
that they spare his younger brother Belgatui before the two shot both of their arrows into their older brother. Due to Mongol fear of blood, they did not approach their dying brother and abandoned him to die alone. When they arrived home, their mother immediately saw in their faces what they had just done. In fear and horror, she screamed, Destroyer! Destroyer! You who came from my womb, clutching a black blood clot in your hand. To Kassar, you, like a wild dog, gnawing its own afterbirth. She screamed on and on, demonizing her children as animals with no control. Finally, she repeated what Begter had told them moments before. Now, you have no companion other than your shadow. Temujin was now the head of a household, but he was now also a murderer. Without the protection of anyone, he would have to decide how to survive. The Taiochid, who put them in this situation, considered themselves to be the lawgivers in the area, and set out to punish Temujin for what he had done. The clan sent out a small party to capture the boy murderer. Temujin attempted to flee, but was nevertheless captured and brought back to the Taiochid camp, a criminal and a slave. He was kept in the camp of the other slave families owned by the Taiochid, and strapped into a device, which restrained his hands and prevented him from doing anything for himself. However, the slave families treated him with great care and tended to the wounds created by the device. Temujin spent a great deal of time a slave, but this too would simply be another obstacle that he would overcome. Eventually, patience lended Temujin a way out. He was assigned to care for a simple-minded and incapable boy. He used the device which they had used to enslave him and struck the boy across the head, knocking him out cold. He immediately hid nearby the camp, knowing that he could not escape across a step on foot. That night, he found the family who had treated him kindly, and rather than report him, they fed him and provided him with a horse to escape with. Temujin was now 16, and it had been seven years since he had seen his wife Bort. He set out with the surviving half-brother Belgatui and found Bort's family. The family was happy to give him his wife, as she was now long past marriage age at 17. As was custom, the wife's family gave a gift alongside the bride, a prized black sable fur. Temujin decided to use the gift to create a needed alliance with his father's old ally, Onkong, the Khan of the Great Karyid tribe. At the time, the Mongol world was ruled by three large tribes. In the center was the Karyid, ruled by Onkong. To the west, the Naiman under Taeong Kong, and to the east were the Tartars under Altan Khan, who were vassals to the Jurchid of Manchuria. Ong Khan gladly accepted the gift and assumed the role of Temujin's father. But this did not signify an end to Temujin's struggles on the steppe, for the Merkid, who had long ago had their wife stolen from them by Temujin's father, now sought vengeance. However, they did not seek the old widow Holin as she was now, but Temujin's wife, Bort who was still young and valuable as a wife. On one fateful morning, an old woman whom they had taken into the camp awoke to find the ground faintly vibrating. She immediately alerted the family. Temujin and his small but growing band of young men jumped on their horses and fled, leaving his wife behind, knowing that she was the target of the raider's mission. He knew that he had no chance against them now, but that if he fled, he had the potential to gain the power necessary in the future. After fleeing the Merkid, Temujin prayed to Burkhan Khaldun, the mountain which had provided him cover from the prowling Merkid. He made thanks to the old woman who had saved them, and to the spirits that had allowed him to live. It was here that Temujin decided that he would not live the life of a leader of a small band of outcasts, constantly running from those more powerful than him. He would be the one who hunted down others. He returned to Onkan and explained that he wanted to launch a raid on the Merkid for what they had done to him. The Khan immediately agreed, for he had lingering problems with the Merkid, and saw this as a chance to settle those issues. The Khan sent Temujin on a mission to seek support from another ally, namely Jamoka, the sworn blood brother to Temujin. He immediately agreed to help his brother, under the order of his Khan. The three groups gathered together, with Jamoka leading his army to the east, and Ong leading his to the west. The force caught the Merkid by surprise, and swept down into the enemy's encampment before they had a chance to flee. The Merkid were in shambles. The panic, caused by the news of the attack arriving moments before they had arrived, caused the whole string of encampments to be easily overtaken and raided. While the raiders looted the girths of the enemy, Temujin raced from camp to camp, screaming for his wife. Bort had been loaded into a cart to flee, and had no idea who was attacking, much less that it was a raid with her as the objective. But she suddenly began to hear cries of her name 
from amid the turmoil that had surrounded her. She jumped from the cart and ran towards the voice. Temujin looked through the darkness of night, shouting her name when he saw her. Temujin then turned and said to the troops, We have made their breasts to become empty, and we have made their beds to become empty, and we have made an end of the men and their descendants, and we have ravished those who remained. The murkid people, being so dispersed, let us withdraw ourselves. Now at the age of 18, Temujin had his wife, his small family, and protection. He had come a long way since his childhood, but problems are never too far around the corner, and as Temujin enjoys his newfound comfort, trouble presents itself. Shortly after the rescue of Bort, it was discovered that she was pregnant. The subject of the boy's father would become a determining factor in Mongolian politics for years to come. Temujin would give his firstborn the name Jochi, or guest, in Mongolian. At the time, Temujin's small band were guests in Jamukha's larger tribe, and the name may have been used as a token of appreciation to Jamukha's hospitality. The two men made yet another vow of brotherhood together, this time as grown men, a sign that would foretell of their coming strength together, not only as allies, but as brothers. Temujin would no longer be a hunter, living on the edges of the world, off whichever catch his small band could obtain. He was now a herder, and with the luxuries of a large herd, comes the threat of anyone else who wants to take those luxuries from you. Temujin's close relationship with Jamanga provided him a special status within the clan, so that he did not simply join as a regular member. And so for the time being, Temujin found it acceptable to live under Jamaka's leadership. But as Temujin's past foreshadowed, he was not the type to sit idly under anyone else's orders. In Mongolian society, each lineage was known as a bone. The closer lineages were known as white bones. This was the immediate family. The more distant the relation, the blacker the bone of the lineage. Jamaka and Temujin were both distantly related, as everyone was on the steppe. They could trace their lineage to a single woman. Jamaka's family claimed lineage from her first husband, and Temujin came from her second husband. Because Jamaka's descendant was a steppe herder, and Temujin's a hunter, Jamaka could claim that his lineage was superior, and that fact would prove impossible to break if Temujin would ever seek to become the leader of the band. Temujin's family would always be the black-boned kin, and the only way for him to establish himself as a white-boned would be to create a new clan for himself, in which his family ruled from the center. And this thought would become tempting, as over time, Jamaka began to treat Temujin less like a sworn blood brother, and more like a black-boned younger cousin. One day, while the band made their way for summer pasture, the two, like usual, rode at the front of the long train of family and followers. But on this fateful day, Jamaka decided that he was no longer willing to share leadership, perhaps because he felt that Temujin's popularity with the other members of the band was getting too out of control. He told his blood brother that he himself should lead the horses higher up near the mountains, and that Temujin should take the less prestigious sheep and other livestock closer to the river. In this power play, Jamaka was asserting his power as the white-boned leader of the group, and showing the rest of the band that Temujin was still black-boned. Upon hearing this, Temujin consulted with his mother. This had thrown him off guard, and he was uncertain of how to respond. Bort overheard and immediately jumped into the conversation, and demanded that Temujin break apart from Jamaka, and that anyone else who would follow them should do so too. That same day, Temujin and his followers left the camp in secret, and many of Jamaka's followers came with. They continued throughout the night to put distance between themselves, in case Jamaka sought to seek vengeance on the group for taking some of his followers. Despite the breaking apart of the group, Jamaka did not pursue, but the conflict that they avoided that day would reign over the two groups for years to come. Now 19, Temujin had chosen his path, not only as a survivor, but a ruler. The conflict between the two brothers would linger for decades, as the two groups stole animals and women from each other, in raids that would happen on the fringes of the two groups. The next chapter in their history saw the two camps grow larger and larger as they each acquired followers and power. Yet neither of them gained the same power that the more powerful Naiman, Karyad, and Tartars had. Now 27, Temujin felt capable of asserting himself as Khan, the ruler of all Mongols, in a play that he had hoped would result in Jamaka's followers deserting to his camp. He summoned his followers to a steppe beside the Blue Lake, where they held a curl tie, the Mongolian voting event in which families showed their support by simply being present. The event had a low turnout and showed that Jamaka still had a larger band of followers. This event showed how Temujin's clan 
was still a small band of families in comparison to the larger clans that surrounded him. Shortly after the event, Temujin sent word to Owen Kong to submit that he was still a vassal and that he simply meant to unify the Mongols underneath him and his tribe, the Karyid. The Khan agreed and seemed fine to let the two brothers fight amongst themselves so that they stayed weak and unable to contend with him as the Khan of the Karyid. Despite the failure of the Kuraltai, Temujin decided to enact some of the changes that he saw fit as Khan. In most larger clans, the Khan had a complex of Gurs in the center of the camp, which were inhabited by the white-boned relatives of the Khan, which served as the center of the leadership of the entire clan. Temujin, however, decided to assign responsibilities, and therefore the Gurs, to those who seemed the most capable or loyal to the Khan, rather than by blood or bone. Jamaka and all of the rest of the white-boned families that supported him saw these changes and Temujin himself as foolish and insolent. The growing fear of Temujin and his new ideas created a powerful desire to put him in his place. During a cattle raid conducted by Temujin's subordinates, one of Jamaka's kinsmen was killed, and Jamaka used this as a justification to start a war. The two small armies gathered for the fight. Temujin's army was routed by Jamaka's force, and in one of the deciding moments in the long conflict between the two men, Jamaka cut off the head of one of Temujin's generals and tied it to the tail end of a horse. This act horrified many Mongols, and word of this event spread throughout the steppe, stirring up support for Temujin and fear of Jamaka. Now 33, Temujin had received word that the Jurchid from the south of the Gobi that separated Mongolia and China had sent word to the Karyid and Ongkong to attack the Tartars on the basis that they had grown too strong. Upon word of this alliance, Temujin sent word to the Jurchid, a tribe located near to Temujin's camp. The Jurchid accepted the offer and agreed to raid the Tartars with Temujin and Ongkong. However, in a feast that was held shortly before the raid on the Tartars, Belgatui, Temujin's half-brother, was assigned the duty to watch over the horses of Temujin's small band, when a man from the Jurkin, known as Buri the Wrestler, tried to steal one. In response, Belgatui challenged the man to a wrestling match. Buri responded by unsheathing his sword and slicing at Belgatui's shoulder, to show that he was too beneath him to be fit to challenge him in such a way. When Temujin gathered his forces, however, the Jurkin did not show, and after waiting for days to no avail, the Mongols left without them. This act infuriated Temujin and wouldn't be forgotten. The raid was conducted in the same way that all steppe raids were, but on a larger scale, and the result was easy success. The loot from the Tartars was on a scale unseen before by the Mongols. Because the Tartars were geographically located closer to China, and by extension the Silk Road, goods from all over the world flowed into the Tartars' camps. When the Mongols entered, they were stunned at the wealth and beauty of the gold and silver that they found throughout. Even the children wore elaborate fabrics and were decorated in golden accessories. When the Mongols returned home, the wealth that they returned with attracted even more followers to Temujin's cause. His power slowly expanded out to acquire more and more smaller tribes under his domain. One of such tribes were the Jurkin, whom Temujin still had lingering animosity towards. During the raid, the Jurkin had conducted a raid on his camp, killing some of his followers and stealing from the rest that survived. Temujin then raided and conquered the Jurkin with ease, and instituted his new ideas on the tribe. Typically, within Mongolian raids, the loser was looted and occasionally had some of its members taken as prisoners. Temujin had a new idea in mind for the Jurkin. He summoned another Kuraltai among his followers and conducted a public trial of the Jurkin aristocratic leaders for the lack of assistance in raiding the Tartars after agreeing to accompany him. The leaders were found guilty and executed. This served as a powerful message to anyone else that Temujin would reward those loyal to him and punish those who wronged him. In another of Temujin's new ideas, he occupied the lands of the Jurkin and gave the remaining members of the Jurkin spots within Mongolian families in order to unify the clans within each other and to strengthen them both. The Jurkin were not slaves, but rather newly formed Mongols. To solidify his message as the new ruler of the Jurkin, he held a feast to signify the unification of the victorious Mongols and the newly adopted Jurkin. In this feast, Buri the Wrestler was summoned for a rematch with Belgatui. This was to be seen as a way of amending all of the previous qualms that the two clans had in the past. Buri was known as an undefeatable wrestler. With a perfect record, everyone would have expected him to come out the victor. However, 
Fearful of Temujin's potential wrath, he gave way to Belgutui and let him throw him. This was a mistake. Belgutui wrapped his arms around Buri's shoulders and mounted him from behind. As Temujin's power continued to grow, so too did the animosity towards him. The white-boned lineages of the steppe weren't happy with the changes he was making and the power that he was gaining to support those changes. Over time, Jamaka became the rallying point for anyone who opposed Temujin's power. Jamaka summoned a Kurultai to appoint himself Gur Khan, the ancient title which meant Khan of all Khans. The last person to hold such a title happened to be Ong Kong's uncle, who was the previous Khan of the Karyid. Therefore, by proclaiming himself Gur Khan, he was not only challenging Temujin, but Ong Kong as well. In response to Jamaka, Ong Kong decided to personally lead a coalition of his and Temujin's followers. The two sides met each other on the steppe. Each side attempted to inflict negative morale through a series of fear tactics. Shamans from each side would beat the drums of war and predict their side as the victor by reading cracks and bones. They were thought to be capable of changing the weather, and when the army of Temujin and Ong Kong's shamans accurately predicted a coming storm, Jamaka's forces fled in fear of the shamans and the power of the men who controlled them. Ong Kong and Temujin split up to chase down the fleeing force. When Temujin's force finally caught up to the Taichid, the same clan that had enslaved him as a child, Temujin's army came upon the enemy with the force of a lightning storm. After defeating them, he found the family who had helped him escape and freed them from slavery. It had been 30 years ago when Temujin was nothing but a slave to a clan in the distant reaches of modern-day Mongolia, and now he had conquered them. And as he looked into the past, he began to look into the future and think of what it might hold in store for him. Meanwhile, Jamaka had escaped Ong Kong and his army, and this would not be the last of Jamaka. He still had allies, and Temujin had not won yet. Now that Temujin had gained enough power, Ong Kong believed him capable of going on another raid against the Tartars. He subdued the Tartars, and rather than loot the city immediately after defeating the enemy, as would have been normal practice in previous raids by the Mongols, Temujin decided that he would obtain complete victory by waiting to loot the city until the fleeing enemy had been captured. He ordered that all the goods be looted and be brought to him to be handed out as he saw fit. He redistributed the loot to each soldier that fought in the conquest, but he also awarded an equal share to every orphan child created during the fight. In another revolutionary practice, he decided that unlike previous Mongolian raids, the captured soldiers and civilians were not to be either killed or left in their city, but were now a part of his territory and were to be treated as kinsmen. This initial conquest brought so many Tartar citizens into Mongolian society that over time, their name is what came to be known most throughout the world to represent the Mongolian people. Temujin's profound new laws sent shockwaves throughout Mongolia. He became known as the hero of the people, and as he added more and more revolutionary laws, more and more followers began to flock to his tribe. With a growing population of his camp, he decided to create a system to organize his army and entire society. He created squads, which were broken apart into groups of 10, 100, 1000, and all the way up to 10,000. In this new system, everyone within his dominion were of the same bone and were expected to act like it. Ong Kong had noticed Temujin's growing power and started to become fearful of it. Temujin had sensed that trouble might arise out of his new strength, and proposed a marriage between the families of the two Khans, proposing his first son Jochi to marry Ong Kong's daughter. Ong Kong accepted the proposal and invited Temujin to the wedding that would take place for the new couple. With false trust for the Khan, Temujin set out with a small group of men and his family. One day, before they reached the location for the wedding, Temujin learned that the invitation was a trap and fled dispersing with a small contingent of warriors that he brought with him into all directions as he attempted to escape Ong Kong's large army. After chasing off the small force of Temujin, Ong Kong celebrated, thinking that Temujin had been dealt with and that he was no longer of any trouble. But Temujin had not been dealt with. After regrouping with his men, he sent word to his followers of what Ong Kong had done, and within days, his army had assembled itself around him. Overconfident, Ong Kong celebrated as Temujin's army raced towards his camp. As the army rode towards Ong Kong, Temujin had already stationed reserve stations with reserves of fresh food and horses. Without any pause, Temujin could blink into the camp of the Karyid. Ong Kong's family was forced to flee in every direction, each meeting their end in various ways. Jamaka yet again fled from beneath Temujin's foot to the Naiman in the west. 
Ong Kong, reportedly arrived at the border of the Naiman territory alone and in ragged condition. The guard refused to believe that this man was the great warrior ruler, Ong Kong, and killed him on the spot. The Naiman were now the last of the great clans that Temujin had yet to conquer, and they made their position with the Mongols clear by capturing a Mongol horseman, whose horse was rumored to be so tiny and skinny that the Mongols could not possibly be capable of contending with the great Naiman. The Mongols were outnumbered, and Temujin knew that, so he ordered each of his men to light five campfires to give the impression to the Naiman that the Mongols were a vast army, far larger than they had originally believed them to be. Knowing his army was nonetheless outnumbered, Temujin used his squadrons of ten to swarm the Naiman from all directions, sometimes laying low while another group attacked the Naiman from another side and then popping out of hiding and surprising the Naiman from nowhere. He used several other formations to attack the Naiman that left their numbers useless to them. One was a formation in which squadrons would advance in the shape of an arrow and volley arrows at the enemy, then immediately flee to the rear as new squadrons came to replace them. The tactics that Temujin used against the Naiman allowed his smaller army to easily crush the Naiman. The Naiman Khan was executed, while several of his family members died in their attempts to flee. Jamaka managed to escape from Temujin's foot once again, but no longer had any white-boned family to run to, and was forced to live as an outcast. With his small band of followers by his side, Jamaka was forced to hunt wild animals and live the same life that Temujin once had. The last symbol of Mongolian white-boned ancestry was condemned to the lifestyle of a forest hunter who lived on scraps at the outer edges of Temujin's territory. A year later, Jamaka's small group of followers captured him and turned him into Temujin, hoping that they would receive some reward. Temujin rewarded their betrayal by executing them in front of Jamaka. He then turned to Jamaka, looking back on their days as brothers, and offered him a chance to amend the past that had seen them brought apart, to unify his brothers and to rule together. Jamaka responded like this, Now, when the world is ready for you, what use is there in my becoming a companion to you? On the contrary, sworn brother, in the black night, I would haunt your dreams. In the bright day, I would trouble your heart. I would be the flea in your collar. I would become the splinter in your door. Kill me and lay down my dead bones in the high ground. Then eternally and forever, I will protect the seed of your seed and become a blessing for them. Temujin granted his brother's wish and buried him with the same belt that he had given him when they swore each other blood brothers. Temujin had now destroyed all who opposed him. With his lifelong rival Jamaka defeated, all of Mongolia was now undisputably his. He was no longer the same orphan outcast, living on the edge of the world, running at the sound of any potential danger. He was now the ruler of Mongolia. He ruled everything from the Gobi Desert to the south to Siberia in the north. A year after the defeat of the Naiman in 1206, Temujin held the most important curl tie to ever take place in Mongolian history. It would be a massive celebration with many Mongolian games of sport, including archery, wrestling, and hunting. Tents stretched for miles as Mongolia celebrated its new emperor. It was now that Temujin had come to pass, and the mighty Genghis Khan enters the world. The Mongolian nation had been formed, and the rest of the world now began to take notice of this new ruler. To the south of the new nation, the northern Chinese state of the Jurchid had recently proclaimed a new king to the throne. The Jurchid had previous relations with Mongolia, pitting leaders against each other in order to keep each large tribe too weak to contend with the Jurchid. To the Jurchid, this new Khan was simply an out-of-hand chief on the border of civilization. Delegates arrived to announce to the Mongols the new golden Khan of the Jurchid, and to demand that the Mongols submit to the Jurchid throne. Genghis Khan had been long past his days of submission to another man. He would not submit to these oppressors, who did not respect him or his people. As the Mongol army marched south on the Jurchid cities, the Jurchid had no fear of the Mongol horde. The Mongols were severely outnumbered and less technologically advanced, but the Jurchid would be the first to learn that the Mongol horde was something to be feared. Unlike the armies of walled cities, the entirety of the Mongol army was composed of cavalry, all of whom were trained to fire accurately with a bow while mounted and who could survive independently while traveling from one place to another. This meant that the Mongol army had no need for supply trains. As long as there was grassland for their animals to feed, the Mongol army could outlast any walled city. Nevertheless, the Mongols were fighting on alien soil against a larger, more technologically advanced force, 
Genghis Khan, however, had known how to defeat a stronger opponent, as that was the only thing he had done his entire life. Before facing the walled cities of the Jurchid, Genghis ordered his generals to spread out and wreak havoc on the countryside. As was common in all warfare at the time, the armies spread out, pillaging village to village, taking any loot that they saw fit. The Mongols did not, however, stop at supplies. The villagers themselves were of great use to the Mongols, who needed the manpower for basic tasks like filling moats, manning battery rams, or simply gathering more resources for the army. As the Mongols spread throughout the countryside, more and more people fled to the walled cities, which created more and more tension as the overpopulation caused the already diminishing condition of the cities to worsen. Starvation, disease, and mutinies caused many cities to concede to the Mongols without a single battle ever taking place. And when battles did take place, the numerically superior Jurchid found themselves at a disadvantage. The Mongolian Tumen units were more agile than their Chinese opponents. The Jurchid armies were broken apart into large formations, similar to most sedentary civilizations at the time. The Mongols could organize their force all the way down to a single man with ease, and the fluidity of the Mongol force would have given the enemy the impression that the Mongols were a hive mind. The Mongols captured Chinese engineers and forced them to create siege engines that allowed the Mongols to destroy the large walls that had prevented them from raiding south in the past. Genghis recognized the disparity in technology between his enemy and his own army, and he fixed this problem by rewarding any engineer or scientist that defected to the Mongol side. The Mongols used tactics on the Jurchid that they had developed on the steppe for centuries. To the Mongols, the Jurchid were simply cattle to be rounded up. When a city was holding out for too long, the Mongols feigned retreat and enveloped the Jurchid as soon as they came out of their walls. City by city fell. At last, Genghis captured the capital of Zhongdo, or present-day Beijing, and forced the Golden Khan to submit as a vassal of the Mongols, and to forfeit gold, silver, and silk to the Mongols, as well as men and women, to take home to Mongolia. What began as the Jurchid attempting to force the Mongols into a position of slavery, as they had for centuries, did not turn out the way that they had anticipated. Genghis had now conquered his first kingdom, and he could taste his future. The Mongols were no Chinese slaves. As the Mongols left the Jurchid lands, they trampled farmland and returned the country to open steppe. Herds of animals could now migrate into Jurchid lands, and the Mongolian army could now navigate more easily throughout Jurchid territory. When Genghis arrived home with his army, he brought with him more loot than Mongolia had ever seen. Streams of gold, silver, and silk flowed into Mongolia from China. Not only commodities, but also Chinese craftsmen, doctors, and scholars. Mongolia had become a wealthy nation within less than a lifetime. Herders were now wealthy beyond their wildest dreams. But this new wealth created demand. Mongolia needed more. Genghis now controlled vassal states surrounding Mongolia. The Muslim Uyghurs to the west proved loyal to him in his conquest of his newest territory in northern China. However, further to the west, there were more Uyghurs under the control of a Buddhist aristocracy recently overthrown by Guchleg, prince of the Naiman. Guchleg had married into the Buddhist royalty and overthrew his father-in-law to become ruler of the Uyghurs. He was a ruthless leader who did not tolerate the religion of his subjects. The Muslim call to prayer was forbidden, and the population was persecuted daily. In one instance, shortly after leaving for an excursion to conquer land, the gates to the city were closed behind him. Guchleg returned with an army, captured the city, and razed it. The Uyghurs had nowhere else to turn, as the Muslim West had no interest in their distant affairs, so they turned to Genghis and pleaded with him that they free them of religious tyranny. Genghis Khan heard their plea and sent one of his generals on a mission to overthrow the ruling class. He had a reason after all. Guchleg was the last of his enemies he had yet to kill. When the Mongols arrived, they easily defeated the armies Guchleg could muster and killed the rest of the aristocracy. The Mongols did not plunder the Uyghurs and declared that religious freedom was restored to the people. Genghis Khan now fully controlled all of the surrounding nations around him, and he no longer had any enemies to fear. Comfortable with the safety of his people, he could now look outward to try to satisfy his people's need for more loot. Genghis sent three ambassadors to the easternmost Muslim nation known as the Khwarezm, to the Sultan Muhammad II. The ambassadors requested that their people trade fairly and uninterrupted. They brought with them Genghis Khan's word. I have the greatest desire to live in peace with you. I shall look on you as my son. For your part, you are not unaware that I have conquered northern China, and subjugated all of the tribes of the north. You know that my country is an ant heap of warriors, a mine of silver, 
and that I have no need to covet other dominions. We have an equal interest in fostering trade between our subjects. The Sultan reluctantly agreed to Genghis Khan's wishes and sent the ambassadors back to Mongolia. Shortly after, hundreds upon hundreds of merchants from all over Mongolian lands came from Mongolia with caravans full of Chinese silks and other precious materials. When they entered the first Khwarezm city, they were stopped by the governor, who ordered the merchants killed and all of their goods taken. The governor's mistake would not only doom him, but open the rest of the world to Genghis. Genghis Khan was infuriated and sent envoys to order the sultan to punish his governor. The sultan killed some of the envoys and mutilated the faces of the rest to return to the Khan and deliver his message. Yet again, the world lacked the fear of Genghis that he deserved, and yet again, they would be proven wrong. The Mongols moved like lightning. They moved through the desert surrounding the Khwarezm Empire and were behind the enemy before the Muslims knew the Mongols had moved against them. Genghis annihilated the Khwarezm, ruling over the empire in less than a year. The Sultan Muhammad II fled his empire deeper into Muslim lands, and the Mongols gave chase. In each city the Mongols captured, they slaughtered the soldiers. The Mongols had no need for infantry and could not afford to leave enemy armies behind them as they advanced westward. The rest of the able-bodied population was then captured and used by the Mongols in the war. Digging holes, filling trenches, and simple meat shields were all of great use to the outnumbered Mongol force. The Mongols killed the aristocrats in every city they captured. This prevented any potential rebellion, with no army or leaders to lead them, and to the Mongols, eliminated a useless mouth to feed. In one famous case, the mother of the sultan was captured in her city, watched as her family and advisors were killed, and was then sent back to Mongolia to serve the Mongols as a slave. During this conquest, the Muslim scholars of the time recorded Genghis Khan's most famous quote, The greatest joy a man can know is to conquer his enemies and drive them before him, to ride their horses and take away their possessions, to see the faces of those who were dear to them bedewed with tears, and to clasp their wives and daughters in his arms. During the conquest of the famous city of Nishapur, a stray arrow killed one of Genghis Khan's son-in-laws. After conquering the city, Genghis gave the decision of what to do with them to his widowed daughter. She demanded that everything living in the city be killed. Pyramids of heads were piled in the city center, one each for the men, women, and children. But the Mongols did not stop there. Every animal was killed, and the city was burned to the ground to be sure that no living thing survived in it. As the Mongols conquered, they destroyed irrigation systems and eradicated pasture in order for the Mongol army to navigate more easily throughout the landscape. But as the Mongols easily plowed through Central Asia, problems within the family grew. Genghis brought his four son-in-laws with him on the conquest of the Khwarezm in order to teach each of them not only battle tactics, but also how to cooperate with each other. In Mongol custom, the sons of a conqueror, like the sons of a herder, would each receive a portion of their father's land as well as a portion of his livestock and followers, in the case of Genghis Khan. But one son would be chosen to receive the largest chunk of territory, as well as the largest chunk of rule, as the leader of the empire. Genghis Khan held a curl tie to discuss the matter of his succession. Jochi was the oldest of his sons, and thus, in many's eyes, the obvious choice for the successor to Genghis. His origins, however, would create cause for concern. Chagatai, the second son of Genghis's, spoke out in the curl tie, with a sentiment shared by many in the Mongol court. How can we allow ourselves to be ruled by this bastard son of a Merkid? Jochi leapt across the tent, and the two brothers beat each other. Genghis broke down in tears in front of the foreign historians recording the event, as he pleaded with his sons to forgive their parents and reminded them that things were different back then. He told his sons to accept each other and to move on from this problem. Chagatai reluctantly accepted his father's words, and suggested that their brother Ogedai be ruler instead. Knowing that he wouldn't be selected for his actions, but not wanting Jochi to be ruler either, he suggested this compromise. Jochi realized that if he did not accept, the only other course of action would lead to civil war, so he reluctantly accepted. And so, Genghis divided his lands amongst his sons, and in an event similar to the Treaty of Versailles, the world had been carved up by the wish of a single man. Ogodai would be best described as a good-natured drunkard, who kept the empire together through sheer charisma after his father's death. The expedition Genghis Khan set out on, originally to conquer the Khwarezm, ended in modern-day Pakistan. As the Mongols moved into the Indian subcontinent, the heat proved too great a problem to overcome for the Mongols, who were used to the frozen tundra, not the human marshland that they encountered as they entered India. The Mongols had conquered the easternmost Muslim world, 
and on their trek back to Mongolia, celebrated by holding the biggest hunt in human history. Giant swaths of land were fenced off to create a great field of livestock for the Mongols to hunt down in parties. However, Jochi never attended the hunt, and his growing feelings of animosity towards his father and family created a distance between him and the Mongol aristocracy. Jochi stayed with his men to watch over the newly conquered territory, and never returned to Mongolia. Shortly after Genghis Khan left for home, Jochi died, and the potential for rebellion was snuffed along with him. When Genghis returned home, he set off to put the Tanjit vassal state back into submission for not supplying men for the Khwarezm expedition. But as he set off for the reconquest and submission of the Tanjit, Genghis Khan's failing health became evident as he fell off his horse. Genghis Khan would follow his son on this return to the Mongols' first experience with conquest outside of Mongolia. When asked about his legacy, Genghis Khan declared that, A mighty name will remain behind me in the world. When on his deathbed, the last words Genghis spoke were to his sons, as he instructed them to work together to continue his legacy and to conquer the world as was their birthright. Little is known of Genghis Khan's death or of his burial, but of what is known, it is known that he was buried simply and in Mongol tradition, in the same way that he lived. Genghis Khan was buried as he requested, without any sign or indicator marking the location of his body, near his birthplace along the Onan River, quietly and in peace. According to legend, the escorts who brought Genghis's body to the burial location killed anyone who saw them, and after building the tomb, the slaves were killed and the soldiers who killed them were killed before they arrived home. And a river was diverted over his tomb to prevent anyone from ever finding the great Khan in his eternal rest. However, as Ogadai stepped into power, he did not bring the same worldview as his father. The minimalist herder from the Mongol steppe was now replaced by an immeasurably rich drunkard. A feast was held to celebrate Ogadai's coming to rule, and Genghis's vault of treasure was distributed amongst the royal family. However, Ogadai was more than a drunk, and definitely wasn't a fool. Ogadai strengthened trade routes and commissioned the building of road markers to mark the trade routes in all weather. In order to smooth the borders between his empire, Ogadai created a standardized system of weights and invented paper money for the first time in human history. Buildings were created all over the empire to station the army and to secure a steady flow of goods and taxes back to the capital. The Mongol Empire had begun to set its roots, but the building and maintaining of structures across the empire as well as the growing army and civilian population was expensive, and the Mongol Empire had begun to run dry on its main source of revenue, war. Though the tribute the Mongols received from their subjects was large, it could never reach the amount that they originally gained from plunder. In order to satisfy his people and to strengthen his name, Ogadai would need to go to war, but what civilization was there left for the Mongols to capture? Ogadai held a curl tie to decide the next target for Mongol conquest. Some suggested India, believing that great wealth lay just beyond their reach before they left the continent. Others suggested that they push further into the Muslim heartland and capture the famous cities of Baghdad and Damascus, while others still thought that they should focus and deal on the enemy closer to home, the mighty Sung Empire to the south. But one man, Subadai, the greatest general that Genghis Khan had in his command, had another idea. Subadai had been Genghis Khan's most successful general in his conquests. He had recently discovered Europe and insisted that the area also held great potential for wealth, on par with India, China, and the Muslim world. He had already conquered Georgia with a small army that Genghis sent him off with in order to hunt down the Sultan of the Khwarezm, and defeated the entire force of the combined armies of Russia. Subadai insisted that Europe's armies could be easily defeated and that they were the best target for Mongol conquest. On the trek back from the Russian conquests, the Mongols had encountered Italian merchants and seen the wealth that these Europeans had in their heartland. Great Khan Ogadai, however, had other plans. He had more to gain from a conquest of the Sung. The conquest of Europe would benefit Batu, the son of Jochi, who controlled the lands to the west and would benefit from the conquest in the future election to come. So in an unprecedented move, the Mongols decided to split out on a conquest of Europe and China. This decision, however, would prove to handicap the Mongol conquests, as without Subadai, the Mongol conquest of the Sung would take decades of slow movements until the Sung would eventually surrender. Europe, however, would go differently. Before the army would move out, small units probed the landscape and their enemies. The Mongols would need appropriate pasture for their animals to graze and for locations to camp, and the Mongols would need to understand these new people, their culture and way of life. When the Mongol army finally advanced, it stood 150,000 strong, 
consisting of 50,000 Mongols and 100,000 allies. The conquest of Europe would be the most impressive the Mongol army had ever been. Battle-tested and adaptable, while still under the guidance of Subadai, not too different from Genghis and his understanding of the way of steppe warfare. The Mongols came upon the Russians, who at this point had forgotten the Mongols, who conquered them and left immediately after, with an unprecedented speed, similar to the German Blitzkrieg 500 years later. The Mongols divided their army apart and set out systematically annihilating the Russian city-states. If one Russian king set out to the aid of another, he risked leaving his land open to another Mongol force. Like the Mongols had done before, an envoy would be sent to the Russian king, demanding that they submit to the Mongol force and join their family. In return, the Mongols would swear protection for the state and allow their royalty to remain in power, and for their religion to remain in place. And just like the Mongols had done before, if the city refused, the countryside would be targeted first. Farmland would be burnt and trampled to restore it to open pasture, and peasants would be rounded up for the jobs that the Mongols didn't want to do themselves, and anyone who hadn't already would flee to the cities. In many cases, the Mongols grew tired of the walled cities that they faced, and used their newly acquired workforce to construct large walls around the city with Russia's large forests. The walls were the same as the walls that the Mongols used to enclose livestock. To Subadai and the older generations, the civilized people who chose to live inside their walled cities were indistinguishable from the animals that the Mongols raised. These livestock, however, built their own walls. From behind the walls, the Mongols could comfortably use their siege engines, perfected with both Chinese and Muslim innovation. Though the Russians had been accustomed to siege engines before, the Mongols were on another level. Chinese gunpowder was also introduced to Europe in these conquests. Small primitive grenades were thrown over Russian fortifications, and incendiary rockets rained over Russian foot soldiers. After looting the captured city and executing its royalty, the Mongols would let large portions of the civilian population flee to the next city to repeat the process. The fleeing refugees that poured across Europe, fleeing from the Mongol armies, brought with them the gory stories of the Mongols, and gave them the European idea of what a Mongol was. The first description of the Mongols in Western Europe went like this. They are called Tartars, from the river Tartar, which runs through their mountains. Tartarus was the Greek name for hell, the lowest cavern beneath Hades, where the Titans had been condemned after creating a war among the gods. The Mongols used the weather and crossed the frozen rivers, and arrived at the largest city in Eastern Europe, Kiev, and like in the past, the Mongol envoys were killed and hung at the gate. The Mongols swarmed the city and easily conquered it with their siege engines. Most of the population was slaughtered, and the Mongols became the first and only people to conquer Russia during the winter. Batu was granted the title Tsar Batu, and the Mongols had completed their conquest of Eastern Europe. But as the refugees fled westward, the Mongols continued to make use of the frozen rivers and crossed into Hungary. But as the Mongols continued to easily defeat the European armies, just as they had done before in the Middle East, the Mongols' greatest battle was being fought from within. Although Ogadai was undeniably Khan, that simple solution would only last a generation. As the Mongols fought in Europe, the future prospects for Great Khan competed against each other for dominance. Subada had been accompanied by representatives from the family of each of Genghis Khan's four sons. When Ogadai would die, one of these men would inherit the title of Great Khan. Just like in the past, in a banquet held to celebrate a recent conquest, Batu, son of Jochi, and eldest of the sons vying for supremacy, spoke first proclaiming his position as the eldest and next in line. And just like in the past, Guyuk, son of Ogadai, spoke out, claiming his right as the son of the great Khan, and yet again, like the past, Buri, grandson of Chagatai, denounced Batu as the son of a murkid bastard. When Ogadai heard of this event, he was angered to no end, and summoned the men back to Mongolia to remind them of their position as generals and Mongol men. After harshly lecturing them, he sent the men back to conquer Europe. When the generals returned, Europe was not ready. The Mongols swarmed from all directions like lightning, easily defeating the force brought together to fight the Mongols of 30,000, assembled from city-states across modern-day France, Germany, and Poland to fight the Mongols. The battle occurred on the modern-day German-Polish border, and was over in the blink of an eye. The knights charged the Mongols, and the Mongols repulsed the first wave. However, the second wave seemed to cause the Mongols to withdraw. The knights celebrated and drove proudly as the Mongols fled. The knights, however strong their armor was, was too heavy for their horses to chase for long, and just as their horses tired, the fleeing Mongols turned on the Europeans and annihilated the force. The superior Mongol bow pierced the knights' helmets as explosives and ancient versions of tear gas erupted around them. The combined forces of Europe's strongest armies were annihilated in an instant.
Shortly after the battle, the Mongols left the Polish and German cities to return to their main objective, Hungary. The Mongols would repeat the same that they had on previous armies. After fleeing for days, the Mongols turned to find the entire Hungarian force camped together with a fenced wall surrounding them. Catapults were pulled up to the camp, and noxious gases were flung into the European camp. As the men fled, they found that they were encircled by the Mongols in every direction but for one hole in the Mongol force. The Hungarians fled through that hole, and as they fled, they broke rank. Each man fled for himself, and the Mongols swept up the Hungarians with ease. The Mongols had ended the European night. Heavily armored men on horses would never return to Europe, as the Mongols had killed them all and introduced gunpowder to them. The Dark Ages were burnt by the Mongols, and from the ashes would rise the Renaissance, and the European fascination with this new world to the east, which would later lead to the discovery of America. The rest of Europe lay terrified. Their armies destroyed, and with nothing standing in the way of total conquest of Europe by the Mongols, the arrival of Mongol scouting parties in Germany shortly after the conquest of Hungary caused the Europeans to panic in terror. But just as the Mongols neared Western Europe, and one of the biggest events in world history, Ogadai, Great Khan, died. As soon as word reached them, the Mongols in Europe immediately returned to Mongolia. As in Mongol tradition, the death of a Khan requires the presence of all Mongols of importance to return home in order to properly vote in the Kurultai to elect the next Khan. In this legendary timing, Europe would be saved, given the knowledge of gunpowder and other Chinese and Muslim innovations, and spared total annihilation, as would happen in the Middle East and Asia. After the death of Ogadai, his wife, Torajin, ruled Mongolia while his successor was being chosen. However, she had been ruling practically for many years, as Ogadai slowly faded away from politics after his unimpressive bouts into China. She ruled the largest continuous empire the world had ever seen, and made decisions that changed the world as we know it. Through her effort, she invited delegates from all corners of the empire, from France to Vietnam, to support her son, Guyuk, as the next in line for the throne of Great Khan. Guyuk began his rule by eliminating his rivals, and those he suspected of not truly allying to him. He killed his great uncle, Temeje Ochigan, the last surviving brother of Genghis, and most of his cousins and the Mongol Empire fell into a state of backstabbing and political insecurity. He moved westward under the pretext of a great hunt, but in reality was moving out to kill his cousin Batu and take his territory in Eastern Europe, and then press further into Europe as he believed it to be a promising target for conquest. However, shortly after leaving for Europe, Guyuk mysteriously died, months after coming into power. Seeing her chance, Sorkatani, wife of Tolui, Genghis Khan's youngest son, stepped into the Mongol Game of Thrones. Batu called for a Kurultai in the Tianxin Mountains outside of Mongolia, electing Monk Kong, Sorkatani's eldest son, as Great Khan. Ogadai's family denounced the Kurultai, claiming its illegitimacy on the grounds that it was held outside of Mongolia. Batu sent a force of 30,000 to guard Sorkatani to the birthplace of Genghis to hold another election. This time, no one could refuse the Kurultai. However, in the celebration not long after the Kurultai, the sons of Ogadai stepped into Monk Kong's Gur and were chained and arrested. Monk had already received word that the prince's act was a ruse, and that they had a force nearby the festival ready to kill Ogadai's enemies. Monk Kong then began a purge of Ogadai's family and their supporters. Monk Kong was not like the previous successors to Genghis. I follow the laws of my ancestors. I do not imitate other countries' ways. Monk was no drunkard and no fool. The Mongol Empire had returned. The Mongol family had shortened itself into two the descendants of Jochi and Batu, and the descendants of Toli, Monk Kong and his brothers. Monk gave Jochi and his descendants Europe, and any conquests that they would have there, and set about himself continuing Mongol conquest. Monk sent his brother Hulagu, the best generals of the brothers, to the west, to finally capture the Muslim heartland and take Baghdad. He assigned Kublai, the most knowledgeable of the Chinese, to take the Sung and finally hold China in their territory. Hulugu sent scouts to reevaluate the Middle East and to recreate the pasture the Mongols needed. The Mongols moved slowly. Unlike in the past, where the Mongols swarmed their enemies from all directions like lightning, the Mongols now had a giant force of siege engines and Chinese and Muslim engineers to use them. Along with them, they brought with them food for their new men. Wheat and rice were carted alongside the army, unlike in the past where the Mongols fed off the land. Along the way, the Mongols put down the areas that had stopped supplying tribute to them since their absence. They then encountered the Nazari Ismailis, the infamous group of Muslim Shi'ad assassins led by a heretical leader. The group came to be known as the Hashashins 
because of their frequent association with hashish, which eventually became the modern word for assassin. The Hashashins had no large army to enact their power, but the group held great power across the planet with terror. Anyone who opposed them would die. The great armies of the Middle East never opposed their unconquerable mountain fortresses. In their previous conquest at the hands of Genghis, the mysterious leader swore obedience to the Mongols. However, when the Mongols left, their enemies had been destroyed, and the Ismailis rose to power in the vacuum created by the Mongols. The Mongols this time conquered the Hashashins for good by besieging the primary stronghold where the Imam lived and offering him mercy if he submitted. Subadai then paraded the Imam from fort to fort to force the surrender of the remaining assassins. The Imam then realized after the final stronghold had been captured that he was useless, and requested permission to go to Karakoram himself and meet the great Mong Kong, hoping that he would strengthen his ties with him. Upon arriving, Mong Kong refused to see him, and the Imam and his men were brought out of the city and were stomped to death. With the assassins dealt with, Hulagu could turn his focus to the main objective, Baghdad. Baghdad was the richest city in the world, standing as the bulwark of the sciences as Europe lay silent during the Dark Ages. Before the assault, the Mongols performed their usual course of action and sent an envoy to demand that the caliph submit to Mongol rule and atone for not sending men to help in the putting down of the Ismailis. Just as those before him, the caliph underestimated the Mongols and scoffed at the Mongol demands. He instead rose up and demanded that the Muslim world unite against these infidel invaders. He announced that Islam could not allow these foreign invaders to occupy the capital of the Muslim world. Hulagu remained unimpressed with the caliph, and set off for the capital, slowly but surely. Along the way, the Mongol vassals from across Europe and Asia marched on the caliph to swarm him from all directions. As the Mongols advanced, the fleeing population flocked to the city, crowding the inner walls beyond their maximum capacity. Soon, the Mongols and their allies had encircled the city and occupied the outer city surrounding the walls. Hulagu ordered his men to begin digging ramparts and ditches around the city for the siege. The Mongols couldn't build a wall of timber around the city like they did in Russia, but they could use the husks of the date palm trees as rockets for the assault on the city. The Mongols bombarded the city with all of the cutting-edge technology that they had cultivated from their conquests, as well as recent innovations brought on by the merging of cultures and technology that the Mongols had created. Smoke grenades, rockets of all sizes and designs, flaming debris from catapults, and all manner of projectiles rained on Baghdad for days. The Mongols then diverted the mighty Tigris River to flood the Caliph's army and take the city. Hulagu ordered the people of Baghdad to leave the city for easier looting. The Caliph was locked in a cell for three days, without food or water, and then Hulagu brought the man his immense collection of gold. Hulagu ordered the Caliph to eat the gold, and the Caliph cried that he could not. Hulagu then asked why he had so much gold in the first place. The Caliph and his male family were then killed, in the same way Mongols killed all people of high birth, without bloodshed. They were wrapped and trampled to death by Mongol horses. The Mongols moved to Damascus, with the further help of Christian crusaders stationed along the coast and the help of the Seljuk Sultan from modern-day Turkey, forced the city to surrender with ease. When the Mongols pushed further west, however, they encountered the western limit of Mongol conquest, as an army of slaves bought by the Egyptians from the Italian Genoans, who themselves had bought from the Mongols in Russia, encountered and defeated their old masters. The Mongols had conquered more Muslim land than the Christians could have ever dreamed of, and done so in the period of seven years. Baghdad would not be conquered by a non-Muslim army until 2003 at the hands of the Americans. However, things on the Chinese front had not fared as well. Kublai moved far too slowly and made far too many mistakes. The fat, gout-ridden old man only sent excuses back to Karakurum, while his brother Hulagu sent word of conquest. Mont Kong was furious and sent the same men that had purged Ogadai's family to investigate Kublai's court. They found suspicion of fraud and fiscal irresponsibility and killed many of Kublai's court. Monk then ordered his brother to Karakurum to answer for his irresponsibility. Kublai threw himself on the floor and begged his elder brother for forgiveness. Monk accepted and decided on a new plan for the conquest of the Sung. Monk decided that he himself should lead the conquest of the Sung. Having trained under Subadai in Europe, he believed that he could overthrow the Sung. Monk ordered his youngest brother, Eric Boke, to rule Karakurum in his stead, and sent Kublai back to his territory in northern China to deal with a religious war occurring between the Buddhist and Taoist monks. Monk swept along the western border of the Sung, capturing the neighboring nations first, as his teacher Subadai would have. After easily capturing the smaller nations, the Mongols began to move on the Sung. 
but the foreign climate and disease proved too strange to deal with and slowed the Mongol advance. And then, seemingly from nowhere, Monk contracted one of these foreign diseases and died. The advancement of the Mongols suddenly stopped, as it had in Europe, as the Mongols scrambled to secure their lands that they had controlled. Rather than the past, where the Mongols returned to Mongolia to vote in a curl tie, each faction stayed in its acquired territory for fear that another would move on them in their leave. The Mongol Empire had become its largest under Mong Kong, and at its largest, fractured into pieces, as the nomadic empires had done in the past. Monk was the last of the great Khans, and as he died, so too did the united Mongol nation. Kublai turned his attention away from the foreign Sung and towards his younger brother, Eric Bok, who held the Mongol heartland. The two brothers held curl ties in each of their lands, and Kublai's lack of Mongol spirit made him alien to most of the family. The Golden Horde, as it came to be known, in Russia supported Eric. Representatives from all branches of the family came to support Eric in his curl tie in Mongolia. Kublai, however, also held a curl tie, and unlike his brother's large support base, Kublai had none other than his own followers. To strengthen himself, Kublai simultaneously decreed himself the title of Zhongtong, to simplify his position not only as Mongol Khan, but also as Chinese Emperor. He had strong control of his Chinese army, as well as his own detachment of Mongols, and more importantly, controlled the farmland that fed Karakoram to the north. Without the flow of food, Karakuram could not function, and it was evacuated in order to not face starvation. Kublai then moved on his younger brother, and slowly took control of Mongolia and Karakuram. Eric eventually submitted to his brother, who demanded that he publicly state which side of the fight was the correct one. Eric bravely stated in true Mongol pride, We were then, and you are today. Eric shortly after died, and Kublai never received the support from the other branches of the family, to the west, and the Mongols remained separated. Kublai would go on to conquer the Sung, as well as parts of Southeast Asia, and submit the rest of Asia as vassal states. The Mongols bled into Chinese culture and founded the Yuan Dynasty. The descendants of Hulagu would found the Ilkhanate in the Middle East, and eventually become the Mughals who would conquer India. The Golden Horde in Russia would create the Russian dynasties that would create the Russian identity that lasts to this day. The Mongol Empire started in the hands of a starving son of a widowed mother, stolen from her first husband and left to die alone in the wilderness on the fringes of human settlement, and ended in the largest empire the world has ever seen.